السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household and all his companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may he bless every single one of us. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, a beautiful evening where we are discussing the last two from amongst the ten who were told that they are from paradise during the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first being Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah. He was a man who had accepted Islam at the age of approximately 28. And he was a man who was very good looking. One of the three who was extremely good looking from amongst the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whereby they actually say it was so pleasant to look at him and to talk to him because not only was he good looking, but he had good character and conduct as well from the very beginning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who develop our character and conduct. Sometimes when we speak to a person, we feel that this person is really worth speaking to. And this is what is meant here when we talk of Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. If you look at his name, he was known as Abu Ubaidah, but his first name was actually Amir. And his father's name was Abdullah. So although he was commonly known as Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, he was actually Amir ibn Abdullah ibn al-Jarrah. That was his name. And he was known as Aminu Hadihi al-Ummah, the trustworthy from amongst my Ummah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had called him Aminu Hadihi al-Ummah, the trustworthy of this Ummah. This does not mean that the others were not trustworthy, but what it does mean is it was one of the credentials that he had, one of the points of virtue of Abu Ubaidah was that he was granted a title by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that none of the others were granted. At the battle of Uhud, he did very well. He was one of those who had stayed with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tried to defend him to the degree that when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was injured, and he had gashes on his cheeks, on his face, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was, there were pieces of the weapon that had remained in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's face. And Abu Ubaidah was the one who took these little shrapnel pieces out of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's face. It is well known that he was the one who took so much care that whilst he was removing them with his teeth, he actually lost two of his teeth. This is how severe it was. And this is how careful this man was when dealing with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the battle of Badr, just prior to Uhud, what had happened was something that is not very easy to mention. Abu Ubaidah, as he was in the battle, there was a man who really tried to fight him and tackle him. And this man happened to be his father. His own father tried to kill him in the battle of Badr. So, Abu Ubaidah tried to avoid him, but the father kept on coming for him. So in defense, he overcame his own father and he did not mean to actually execute his own dad. But in defense, the father lost his life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. One of the stories that is very, very high in terms of the status of this man, Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, was that in Medina Munawwara, one of the groups of the Christians had come through to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Najran. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by them saying, please send one of you with us to come back with us to our area in order to teach us and in order to be a judge in whatever disputes we may have and so on. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was at the first part of the morning, he said, come back to me in the evening and I will send with you a man who is strong and he is the trustworthy of my ummah. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says, I heard this and I was very interested 
I was not interested in being sent, but I was interested in being known with these qualities that were made mention of. So I was early for Salat al Dhuhr, and I sat there with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very near him. And then after Salah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked to his right and he looked to his left and he says, I put my neck up so that he could see me. You know that Umar is here, subhanallah. May Allah grant us ease. And then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, where is Abu Ubaidah, subhanallah. And then he appointed Abu Ubaidah and he told him, go with these people, be just and fair, teach them goodness. And remember, you are a person who I consider the trustworthy of this ummah. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says that as much as I knew that yes, subhanallah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loves us all. But it was on that day that I learned the credentials of this man, Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. He was one of the first who had accepted Islam. It was this group that accepted Islam right at the beginning that made up the 10 who were told that you are from paradise. Imagine one day Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seated and suddenly Suddenly he just said, Abu Bakr is from Jannah. Umar, you are from paradise. Uthman, you are from paradise. Ali, you are from paradise. Az Zubair, you are from paradise. Talha, you are from paradise. And so on. And he continued until the 10 names were mentioned. And subhanallah, Abu Ubaidah was one of the names. So who was instrumental in him accepting Islam? It was none other than Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He was a man initially, he went to all his friends and he convinced almost all of them. Those who were close to him, they knew he was an honest, upright man. So he convinced them how many of us would ever be able to speak to the close friends of ours or business associates of ours to convince them to do something right when they are doing something wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. Many of us, when we are cheered along in our wrongdoings, then we consider such a person a friend. So when I'm doing wrong and someone says, well done, well done, he's my friend. That's what we think. Not realizing a true friend is he or she who tells us what we have to hear, who tells us what we need most desperately to hear, even if it means they have to correct us in a way that we feel bad. The fact that they felt for us makes us genuine friends of ours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us recognize the few genuine friends that we have that stand by our side correcting us rather than a city full of people who may be hypocritical, who try to come to us to befriend us through, through making us do even more wrong after they know we've done wrong. May Allah protect us all. This was the same man when it came to Saqifa to Bani Sa'idah after the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu met with Sa'd ibn Ubadah and the others in Saqifa to Bani Sa'idah to appoint the leader. The first person that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu felt initially that this man would be our leader was Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah. He stretched his hand and he said, Oh Abu Ubaidah, stretch your hand. Let me pledge allegiance to you as the successor of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because wallahi, these ears have heard Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on more than one occasion call you the trustworthy of the ummah. So indeed, you will be entrusted with successorship. And Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah immediately turned it down. And he says, I will never ever put myself in front of a man who was asked to lead the prayers during the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu agreed and they turned to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and they pledged allegiance to him. Take a look today. You have, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a lesson. This man was being offered a post that was not only of spiritual value, but even of political value. And he turned it down. Today, people are fighting for posts that they do not deserve. Do we realize that? This man deserved the post. He turned it down because he was honest. He was definitely a person who was trustworthy. But today, the people who are not even trustworthy and do not deserve a post are busy fighting for it in a way that we lose. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not from amongst the losers. Then at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, something unique happened. One of the leaders of the Muslim army was known as Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. Inshallah, one of the days we will go through his life as well. A brief of his life. We'll get to know him a bit better. So 
this Khalid ibn al-Walid was such a powerful warrior that he used to win all the battles. So what happened is the people started feeling that Khalid ibn al-Walid is very high in rank, raising him higher than he actually was. That was a fear of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. People must not start worshipping the companions. Yes, they must respect them. They must obey instruction. They must understand that the companions are blessed. But that does not mean they render acts of worship to companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So fearing this, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu sent Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah to replace Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. And he wrote him a letter and he sent him. When Abu Ubaidah arrived, he found that Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was busy in a battle. So he decided to wait until the battle was over. It was easy for him to go and say, look, take this letter. Now you are out and I am in. Imagine. But Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah decided, no, that's not how it works. We are not here in order to earn for this world, but rather we are here in order to prepare for the Akhirah. In order to prepare for the life after. This is what Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah used to say. So he waited when the battle was over. He went with utmost humility. He met Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu and he presented him the letter. Khalid ibn al-Walid read the letter and he said, Oh Abu Ubaidah, why didn't you give me this letter earlier? As soon as you came, you could have taken the reins and I would have stepped aside. He said, Oh Khalid, I did not want to disturb you. You were very busy. And at the same time, it is not, you know, his famous statement. He says, Ma sultanu dunya nureed, wala lid dunya na'mal, kulluna fillahi ikhwa. He said, it is not the power or the kingdom of this world that we want. Nor do we work in order to build our world. We are all working in order to build the life after death. And we are all brothers for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So amazingly, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu handed over the leadership to this man. And the man got up, Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. Now he was the new leader of the army. And he decided to address the people. What did he say? He said, oh my people, this Khalid ibn al-Walid, is such a high ranking companion, such a high ranking companion that I have heard Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Khalidun Saifun min suyufillah. Khalid is indeed a sword from amongst the swords of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for me, I am a simple Muslim from Quraysh. Imagine he's a leader, but because he does not want people to lose the respect of Khalid radiallahu an, he says Khalid is the man. I am just a member of Quraysh following instructions of the Khalifa. And I am just a Muslim. And he says, Wallahi, no matter what color you are, if you are better than me in piety, it is my wish to be in your skin. Which means I am trying my entire life and I will continue trying to be a pious person who is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what will make us better. So, in Asham, in the region where he was, up in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula, Abu Ubaidah became known as the leader there. He was the head of the Muslim army and he spent a lot of time. One day, Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu visited Asham and he decided to go to Abu Ubaidah. He asked his people, Where is Abu Ubaidah? They showed him to a little house. He, he knocked on the door, he entered the house of Abu Ubaidah. Or another narration says Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah met him in the masjid and took him home when he asked, let me come to your house. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was a man who always used to be bothered about what those whom he has appointed as rulers and leaders had spent and how much they had involved in this worldly material life. He wanted them to be very transparent. So what Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu did, he entered the home of Abu Ubaidah. And he noticed no furniture, nothing at all. A simple room, nothing to even light a stove, to light, you know, a stove in order to cook. There were a few provisions on one side and on the other side he had his bedding and that's it. And he had his armor and so on in the room as well. So Abu Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu asks him, Oh Abu Ubaidah, why didn't you build yourself a house like everyone else has? He says, Oh Umar, we are here in this world in order to prepare for the life after. It is not this world that I want. It is the pleasure of Allah that we are in search of. This was the man. So he gave up his business and he gave up whatever else there was. Anything over and above what he needed, he did not have. This was the warrior, Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. So much so that 
At the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, a plague broke out in what we would call today Jordan. That is known as a sham, the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, a plague broke out where a lot of Muslims had died and a lot of members of the army were dying one after the other. Now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us that if there is a plague in a certain place and you happen to be in it, do not leave. You must be part of those who are quarantined. This is a teaching of Islam. So the plague happened to be taking so many and the news got to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So he wrote to Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah and he told him, look, I have a need for you very urgently and I want you to come to me as soon as possible. If my letter gets to you in the morning, do not let the evening come without having jumped onto your conveyance and started your journey. And if you get the letter by night, do not let the morning come before you have jumped onto your conveyance and come towards me. I am issuing you this instruction. Now Abu Ubaidah got the instruction and he told the people around him, I've understood what Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu wants. He wants to take me out of this place where there is a plague so that I can be saved. That's the reason. Otherwise, there's no other job. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has instructed us not to leave a place where there is a plague. So I have to write back to Umar to say that as much as you are the Amir, as much as I have to obey you when you are saying come back, but I've understood what you want. And I want to tell you that the statement of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes above yours. Subhanallah. So he stayed in that area. He was caught in the plague and he passed away. Rahmatullahi alayhi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he got the letter, he began to cry. So the people around him asked him, are you crying? Because Abu Ubaidah has passed away. He said, Abu Ubaidah has not yet passed away. But I know from his letter that very soon, perhaps he too will pass away in the same plague. And then the news came confirming what Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was worried about. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu cried so much. He cried so much. And later on, they heard of what happened on the deathbed of this man, Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah. A lesson for us all. Something that really confirms his status. He says, when Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah was on his deathbed, he called the army and the people who were with, and he told them, I am going to give you some pieces of farewell advice. Listen to them carefully and stick to them and you will always be in goodness if you understand and listen to this advice. Number one, your salah, your prayer. Number two, your zakah, be charitable. So establish your prayer and be charitable. Fast correctly in the month of Ramadan and even your extra fasts. And remember, when you are giving charity, give over and above that which is compulsory. Then he said, make sure that if Hajj is compulsory upon you, you fulfill it and ensure that you frequent the house of Allah, even in Umrah. And then he continued, he says, learn to guide one another, advise one another. Do not feel bad when people guide you and when they advise you. And then he continues to say, and this is a powerful part of his statement. Be genuine to your leaders and do not cheat your leaders. Those whom Allah has placed in authority over you, be genuine to them. Do not cheat them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. From this, the term he used was an nush and nasiha, which would mean if your leaders are going wrong, correct them in a good way. But you don't have to cheat them and you don't have to be unruly. Then he said, Wallahi, if you have been given a thousand years to live, there will come a day when you still will have to die. This is what he says. So think about it. He says the most intelligent from amongst you are those who are most conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most intelligent from amongst you are those who are conscious of the day that they will meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think this advice is for us all. It is valid to this day where he says, brothers and sisters, no matter how long your life is going to be, there will come a day when you have to die. Whether it is at the age of 50, 60, 70, 80. And if you really have outlived people, you might live to 90. Most of the companions passed away in their 60s, 70s and 80s. In fact, very few of them reached their 80s. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Yes, yet they were the best of the lot. So this was Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu, Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, 
turned to him and he was the one who had let Salatul Janazah on this man. And he told the people, we have lost such a great man. Make dua for him. Ask Allah to have mercy on him. One hadith that comes to my mind regarding Abu Ubaidah. He asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Messenger of Allah, can there be anyone better than us? We have believed in you and we have struggled. We have struggled in your cause, in the cause of Allah and in the path. As you can see, we believed in you and we have struggled. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, yes, there are people who will come after you who will be better than you because they will believe in me without ever having seen me and they too will struggle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those. Those who believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without even having seen him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us from amongst the goodness that is mentioned in this beautiful hadith. That was Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, one of the ten. And the last one of the ten, a man whom we do not speak about much, Saeed ibn Zayd, Saeed ibn Zayd ibn, ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. He was 20 years old when he accepted Islam. There is an amazing story that I must mention about his father. So our hero here is Saeed ibn Zayd. But his father did not meet the time when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given prophethood. But he had met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prior to prophethood. His father's name was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Listen to this man. He was the, one of the men who never worshipped idols. As he grew up, he got married, he had children. He always questioned what Quraysh was doing. And he went out hunting for the truth. He used to ask the, the monks and the various rabbis from amongst the Jews and the Christians about their faith. And he was friends with Waraka bin Nawfal, who was another man who also was searching for something besides what Quraysh was doing. And this man, Zayd ibn Amr, before Islam, he used to go to those who used to bury their daughters alive. And he used to say, don't bury her alive. Give her to me. I'll look after her. I'll spend on her. And he, it is reported that on one occasion, he actually went to one of these graves. He quickly dug it out and took this girl out before she actually died. And he was the one who used to believe that whatever Quraysh was doing was totally wrong. So one day he sat on the Kaaba or he sat with his back facing the Kaaba. He stood up in fact, and he was facing the rest of Quraysh in one of their great days of enjoyment. And he told him, Oh Quraysh, look at the sheep that you are slaughtering here in the name of these idols. Yet Allah gave the sheep life. Allah caused the rain to fall. Allah caused the plants to grow and the sheep was eating from it and grew. And now you are sacrificing the sheep in the name of the idols. Don't you have any shame? So they beat him up. Although he was a man who beat him up. Sadly, the father of Umar ibn al-Khattab, who was related to him, he was his uncle actually. And his name was al-Khattab ibn Nufayl. This man was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And al-Khattab was al-Khattab ibn Nufayl. You see where they meet? So he beat him up and he told the youngsters of Mecca, chase this man out of Mecca. Don't ever allow him back in. So the father of Sayyid bin Zayd was chased out of Mecca. And he went out, he used to come back at night quietly and he used to meet some of these friends like Waraka bin Nawfal and so on. And they used to discuss what Quraysh was doing. But very early in the morning, he used, to, he used to go back out of Mecca, fearing being beaten and persecuted. So this man, he once went to Asham to meet some of the monks and some of the rabbis in order to find out more about religion. So one of the rabbis told him, you are from Mecca. There is a messenger who's going to come from Mecca. You better go back to Mecca and meet him. You are upon the, the religion of the prophet Abraham. And he too will be calling towards exactly the same. Because this man made it clear, Zayd ibn Amr, he always used to say, I follow whatever Abraham taught. I worship one God and that's it. I follow Ibrahim and Ismail. This is what he used to say. So the rabbi told him, there is a man who will say exactly the same. Go back to Mecca. When you find him, follow him and understand that he is the prophet of Allah truthfully. So this, when this man was coming back into Mecca, sadly he was killed on the road and on the path. And on his deathbed, he told those around him that look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my maker may not have allowed me to meet this man who is going to come out as a prophet in Mecca. 
But I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least my son must be from amongst those who follow him. Now this was Sa'id bin Zaid, our hero, the son of Zaid ibn Amr. And what happened, Sa'id bin Zaid knew about this because he used to discuss this with his family members. Look what Quraysh is doing is wrong. They are worshipping idols, sticks and stones and so on. So the day that Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced that he was a prophet of Allah and Sa'id bin Zaid found out he rushed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an. And he immediately declared that he had accepted Islam. And this was right at the beginning. Not only him, but his wife, Fatima bint al-Khattab, the, the sister of Umar ibn al-Khattab, the daughter of the same man who used to persecute Sa'id bin Zaid's father. They accepted Islam together. So much so that I'm sure we know of the story where Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu a few days later came out to murder Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was his intention. And when he met Nu'aym ibn Abdullah on the path, Nu'aym ibn Abdullah told him, why don't you start with your own family? Look, your nephew and your own sister, meaning your sister, your brother-in-law, they have accepted Muhammad. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu rushed. He went to meet this man, Saeed ibn Zayd, one of the ten. And he saw the sister and you know we spoke about the story a few days ago how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu beat up his sister and brother-in-law and then when he saw the blood he asked for the the little parchments where the Quran was written on and he read Surah Taha and he accepted the faith and he declared his shahada with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this was the house this was the man Saeed ibn Zayd may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness he was the one who took part in the battle of in fact he did not take part in the battle of Badr. One might ask why? It's a question. Talha ibn Ubaidillah and Sa'id ibn Zayd, two from amongst the ten, and they did not take part in the battle of Badr. This was because just prior to Badr, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent them on a mission in order to find something out. So they had not returned except after Badr. So they had gone on the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of that, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam considered them from amongst those who took part when he was distributing spoils and he added their names. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and bless us all. It is reported that in the battle of Yarmouk, this man Saeed ibn Zayd, he was under Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. And he says, I heard Abu Ubaidah. We were only about 24,000 and the Romans were 120,000. We couldn't even see where they ended. And he says, Abu Ubaidah, one of the men said, I think I'm going to die here. So if I meet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you have a message for him? So Abu Ubaidah said, yes, I have a message for him. Tell him that the Muslims are greeting you and tell him we have found what you promised us to be the truth. Wow, what a statement, subhanAllah. So Saeed ibn Zayd says, when I heard Abu Ubaidah say this, radiallahu anhum jami'an, immediately it made us all very strong and we overcame the Romans. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and grant us ease and goodness. Uh, it is reported that he was from amongst those who took part in the conquest of Asham, the Syrian region, the first that it was, it was conquered. Abu, uh, this uh, Saeed ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu was a part of it. And Abu Ubaidah appointed him as a person who was in charge of Damascus. So he was the first who was in charge of Damascus. But a few days later, he went back to Abu Ubaidah and he said, Oh Abu Ubaidah, I don't want to be a leader here anymore. I want to go back and be an ordinary person with the rest of the Muslimin. Subhanallah. This was Saeed ibn Zaid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I want to end with a story in the life of this man, Saeed ibn Zaid. It is reported that later on, in his life, a woman went to Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan ibn al-Hakam was the leader of Medina. A woman went to him and said, you know, Saeed ibn Zaid has stolen my property. Now that is a very, very big accusation. Saeed ibn Zaid has stolen my property. And rumor started spreading in Medina that Saeed ibn Zaid, a companion of Muhammad, what a powerful man. And one of the ten, he has Rumor has it that he has stolen something. Now you and I know that when rumors spread about good people, a lot of the times we would immediately say it's false. In fact, a Muslim should believe immediately that this is false. The minute you hear a rumor about a decent person, 
you tell yourself it's false. A lot of the times we don't, it doesn't even affect us, but we tend to believe things because we are weak. And wallahi, it results in our own downfall. So in this instance, they went to Saeed ibn Zayd and they told him, this is what's happening. The people of Medina are talking. Some of the hypocrites are talking about you. Now he was very sad because obviously he did not want to hurt anyone, but he needed to clarify his name because people would then say, this is a companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and look at what he's done. So what happened is, he said, Marwan ibn al-Hakam sent to him, that look, O oh Saeed, you have a case to answer here. Allahu Akbar. You have a case to answer. Someone has accused you. So he came back. He said, you know what? I have no case to answer. This is my land. And at the same time, I have a dua to be made. And that dua is, oh Allah, if this woman is lying and she intends harm, take away her sight and let her die in the same well that she's accusing me of having stolen. Now this is dangerous because my brothers and sisters, the hadith says, اتقي دعوة المظلوم فإنه ليس بينها وبين الله حجاب You should be very fearful of a supplication made against you by someone you have oppressed because there is no barrier between that dua and Allah. So my brothers and sisters, all of us, we should be worried. If you oppress someone and they raise their hands against you, Wallahi, you would be considered dead meat in our language. May Allah protect us. So this is Saeed ibn Zayd. He made a dua. They say, in a short while, the rains came. When the rains came, there was a flood in Al-Aqiq. And the flood had taken this woman. She had lost her eyesight and she fell into the same well and died in the well. And that is when everyone said Saeed ibn Zaid was innocent. He did not steal the wealth. You see how his name was cleared. So it had to take something of this nature to clear his name. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not from amongst those who spread rumors about the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, we understand the human nature of every individual. We pray for them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. He passed away. In Al Madina Al Munawwara, in fact, in Al Aqiq, which is in the outskirts of Medina, he was buried in Medina Munawwara in the year 51 Hijri. Now we have completed the 10. The 10 of those who were told you are from paradise. Let me quickly go through their names. We must know these names. We have no excuse. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, radiallahu anhum. That's quite easy to remember. Talha and Az Zubair. So Talha ibn Ubaidillah and Az Zubair ibn Al Awwam. That would be six and seven. Then we have Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and Abu Ubaida Amir ibn al-Jarrah. That would be, uh, sorry, uh, that was five and six. This is seven and eight. And the last two, we would have Sa'ad and Sa'id. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Sa'id ibn Zayd. So remember, Sa'ad and Sa'id come together. Talha and Zubair would come together. And Abdul Rahman and Abu Ubaidah would come together. So if you were to be asked, who are the 10? You would say Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Talha, was Zubair, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Abu Ubaidah, and Sa'ad and Sa'id. May Allah's peace be upon all of them. And may Allah's blessings be upon us as well. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahu bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.